Okay, excellent. So welcome everyone to Not at the Museum Thursday night. My name is Christine Girardi, Assistant Curator for the Niagara Falls History Museum. And as usual, I would like to begin our program with a land acknowledgement. The Niagara region of Ontario is located on the traditional shared territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Chinatown peoples. The Chinatown people have called these lands home for thousands of years, and more recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing the land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. Tonight, we are here for the lecture, Understanding the Truth and Reconciliation Report, What Is It All About?, given by Dr. Pamela Williamson. And before I introduce her, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, following her lecture, we will be opening the floor to Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A function. You'll notice at the very bottom, if you're joining us on Zoom, put your questions in there and I will read them aloud to Dr. Williamson at the end of her lecture. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can put your questions into the comments section and I will be monitoring that as well and I'll read them out to her. So that will pause for questions at the very end. So Dr. Williamson is a member of the Moose Deer Point First Nation and from the Sturgeon Clan. After a lengthy time working in both health and post-secondary education sectors and from her personal experience, Dr. Williamson is able to offer keen insights into understanding the realities of living experienced by First Nation people. Dr. Williamson is a strong advocate for the truth and reconciliation recommendations as a means to increase understanding and positive and productive relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people of Canada. So Dr. Williamson, if you'd like to join us now. Hi, Christine, and hi, hi everyone. So this is where I put up my presentation and I'm hoping that everyone is able to see it. One moment, moment, please. Hmm. Everybody is very small. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. And um, I'm now going to be doing introductions. Um, technology is wonderful when it works. And uh, I'm I've been uh, playing catch up and renewing my uh, abilities to use technology this last while. So bear with me as I um, I'm sometimes do glitches or um, I have some uh, technical difficulties. So uh, as an introduction, I just um, you were introduced to myself. I also am a, a mother of three children and I've been married for 44 years and I have two wonderful grandchildren. So as it is, I wanted to thank uh, the Niagara Falls Museum for having me, inviting me to do a presentation. And I also want to thank those that are here tonight uh, to be here uh, to listen. And uh, I appreciate your time. And if you have questions, I am hoping that I um, have the answers for you. And if I don't, I certainly will make sure that I get back and I am able to respond to those. So just a quick overview of this presentation. And when Christine uh, said lecture, I kind of winced because I guess that's the mode I go into uh, when I do these. Uh, hopefully I am uh, give you a sufficient anecdotal information that makes it not just sound like I'm reading everything from my slides. But as an overview, we're going to do a brief recap. Um, as it is, I've done three other presentations that I feel were good follow-up to uh, why we're talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. Um, so then we are going to touch on it uh, briefly, and then we're going to talk about positive connections and changes through the TRC process. I'm looking off to my side because I'm looking at another screen. I trust that's okay. So the purpose of this presentation is to demonstrate the connection between those presentations and to create an understanding of the TRC report and its relevance today and into the future. 
So the sources um, that are, uh, as a preface to this, I've, um, I put this in here um, just to make sure that I cover basis in terms of the materials that I'm using. So the sources and citations are provided. Uh, appropriate recognition is attributed to all original um, contributors, and there has been no attempts to break copyright parameters. And if I have not uh, given any um, um, reference, for material that is not mine, um, it was not intended to happen. Uh, certainly, I will be um, talking about things from my perspective and my experience. So I am a First Nation person, and I my work experiences within primary health care, Indigenous primary health care, and as well as post-secondary at the college level, uh, and also as a volunteer, um, all of my, a lot of my experience has been either as an Indigenous representative or also uh, as um, within an Indigenous organization and so on. So the information, the information is not exhaustive. So one of the things that I really worried about when I was developing this was it really feels sometimes that I'm giving a Reader's Digest and suddenly it occurred to me, yes, you are giving a Reader's Digest version. And so as I am talking about different areas and there isn't enough examples, for example, uh, given the time, um, I really do encourage individuals to seek out more information on those specific areas. Um, you are encouraged to also um, ask questions and discussion is encouraged as much as we can in this forum. Um, but again, it's limited to the time that we've been given. Uh, but even if there's questions that are not um, answered or addressed prior to the end of this, um, please know that I will be um, making sure that I can respond and give information to Christine. So the presentation is intended to be a positive learning experience, uh, create a greater understanding about Indigenous people, and also the, that there be more positive relationships between Canadians and Indigenous communities, individuals, work colleagues, and so on. So, so very quickly, this is just at a glance to be able to say this is the areas that I'm going to briefly uh, touch base on. Um, uh, from the perspective of the previous presentations, I uh, did talk about what, um, what Indigenous people were, and how they lived and where they lived and their cultures and so on prior to European contact, what European imposed changes and restrictions were, long-term impacts and implications, uh, the path to healing, wellness and growth, and then Indigenous people, Canadians and the truth and reconciliation. And truth and reconciliation. So it's from that format if you can visualize the presentation. Uh, again, I've used this slide before, and the reason I feel it is important is I believe it is um, important that you recognize or have a sense of who Indigenous people are from a population base. So there are three distinct groups of Indigenous people recognized under the Canadian Constitution. So there's First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. So the population is about 4.6% of the Canadian population as of 2016 and 5% as of 2021. Um, as a professor uh, back when I worked at uh, the college, which was 20 some years ago, over 20 years ago, um, it was, we were 2% of the population. So it is, um, it is known that we are a fast, um, fast growing population, but this really does demonstrate uh, that. And then the graph that you see in front of you is uh, the table is basically where would you find the, the most um, populations of Indigenous people, uh, Prince Edward Island being the smallest, and it has the smallest population, and Ontario having the largest. So Indigenous populations, again, are comprised between 4 and 5% of the Canadian populations, and in, um, so if you break it down with the First Nations being 60, Métis being approximately 33%, and uh, Inuit are approximately 4%. So it's just to give you a sense of the populations um, in terms of if you were looking at a pie chart. So what are some of the key messages that I wanted to talk about um, from the recap? First of all, 
it is important to know that we are not homo uh, homogenous, that we are diverse groups across Turtle Island with unique languages, cultures, forms of governance, um, social structure, spirituality, uh, the way that we um, interact with each other interpersonally and so many other different ways. Indigenous people as the peoples of the land from time immemorial were given legal recognition by the government of Canada as having inherent rights to the land, to subst substance, resources and activities, to self-determination and self-government and to practice one's own culture and customs. So you'll hear me say over and over again that there is legal recognition given to Indigenous people to those rights. Original peoples were reliant, um, self-governing and thriving cultures uh, and nations across all of the lands that are now called Canada. And often you'll hear individuals talk about called Canada or what is now called Canada. And that's because the borders are artificial in terms of where Indigenous people are from. So we didn't meet the neat and tidy, okay, you know, this is the Canadian border. This is where Ojibwe are. Uh, Ojibwe actually um, are on both sides of um, within the States and within Canada. So I hope that makes sense. European contact changed everything forever. And that's both positively and adversely for Indigenous people. So restrictions, legal in nature, were placed on Indigenous people, including to the land, economic growth, removal of children to residential and day schools, the 60 scoops, to cultural practices and traditions, to their languages. And these are some of the restrictions um, that uh, were discussed in previous um, presentations. Indigenous people were and are treated differently from other Canadians. And that is um, something that I don't know if um, that, um, that Canadians or US participants are aware of, that it is, we uh, have been treated differently from the beginning. And so some of the things that um, were, came about or you can identify as being treated differently is um, through things, such things as colonialism, racism, judicial injustice, social marginalization, and exclusion. So again, those are things that we talked about in um, more detail than examples previously. Long-term and lingering interpersonal trauma was the result of being un, uh, treated unfairly. So that is something that, um, that was talked about in depth, but the fact that it isn't just something that occurred in history, um, it was something that occurred in history and things are still continuing up to today. And the fact that it was over generational, um, over generations of Indigenous peoples uh, lives that were impacted and were uh, faced those things that it has led to what is called intergenerational trauma. So there's also been long term lingering and adverse challenges impacting every part of Indigenous life experience. So the economic growth of our communities and individuals, uh, educational attainment, community infrastructure. So I know it's well known about the issues with water, sewers, and housing. Uh, cycle of social assistance and other dependencies on government for support. And so again, um, those are some examples. Those are key examples, uh, but those those are just to be able to say um, there is substantial, significant um, evidence of things that created some of the issues that continue to plague Indigenous people today. So recognition and knowledge of Indigenous history and Indigenous realities is necessary for you as uh, for us as Canadians and for you as participants. And why? It's because historical actions and practices created the inequities, discrimination, and marginalization. Indigenous history needs to be recognized to understand the realities of being an Indigenous person today. And it is needed because this is the first step to help support positive change today and into the future. So I'm giving you rationalization as to why those are things that are talked about and highlighted. Um, and I'm sure that you've heard or you have read uh, about in, in the media. 
So because Indigenous relations are strongly and legally tied to the federal and provincial governments, they have legal and ethical responsibilities to support Indigenous self-determination and growth. And all Canadians can help support Indigenous self-determination and growth. So again, as a recap, um, also talked about the importance of culture. So culture is important to every culture. Their culture is what makes you a unique um, entity um, that you can have pride in uh, and that you can share with others um, in and knowing, you know, your differences. Um, our differences um, can make us stronger and be, um, and that's what um, I'm going to be talking about in terms of the quotes. Cultural practices and traditions serve many purposes. Often these traditions not only help define a community, they help create a community. They also have healing qualities in that they help us make connections within ourselves a feel, uh, to feel a sense of belonging and strengthen a sense of identity and purpose. So culture is important. Culture is something that has um, been slowly being regained as individuals are seeking that out or as individuals who have more knowledge have been sharing um, with others. The reconstruction of communities devastated by colonization begins with the restoration of tradition, rituals, and languages. So those are quotes. So the resurgence and return to cultural ways of being. Many Indigenous people are seeking to regain their traditions and cultural ways, spiritualities, medicines, their languages, and so on. So I um, when I was a college professor, um, that is one of the things that I can say um, that um, really resonated with me was not only for myself that um, being uh, having the opportunity to be around um, individuals who came in to provide cultural teachings, um, those who spoke the language, who you know who taught um, Ojibwe in my situation. Uh, that's what I would be learning. They were, um, it almost felt like a feast, a time of feast. And I really felt it with the students as well, that, that, that there was this real unique or this desire to be able to relearn or have those things incorporated into their lives where they, they had been lost for them. It is considered a huge step toward personal healing and the healing of communities. Returning to the use of cultural practice is part of healing from intergenerational trauma. So this is one of the things that we ta I talked about with you um, in previous um, sessions was the fact that culture is critical. So <clears throat> according to, I'm going to take a drink one second. According to the Indigenous Services Canada website, in re recent years, the health indicators of Indigenous people are showing some signs of improvement. So even though I was able to show that um, that, that is something that has been, um, that is, there has been some improvements, when we looked at the stats, um, they continue overwhelmingly to be higher in many um, of the issues are they still continue to experience the issues in health, in education, in, you know, housing and all of those other things. It's, it is still a problem, but there is, that's what I think it is important to be able to say that there is signs of progress. 47% um, of Indigenous people perceive that they have good physical and mental health. And that was from a study in 2017. So just as a very re, uh, recap, I'm not going to go through all of this. So there are many programs, um, many um, uh, programs that are um, from, um, that are within Indigenous jurisdiction, um, but also those that are non-Indigenous, where there are now elements or there is an infusion of uh, the culture, that there has been um, a real progress in creating spaces that are culturally re relevant for Indigenous people, um, especially where there are uh, areas where there are large populations of Indigenous people. So these were some of the examples that were given from the previous one. So changes in government policies 
and practices, the government legislation and policies regarding Indigenous people are changing. And so in more recent years, the government is committed to ongoing engagement and consultation with Indigenous groups. And so, I, again, there were a number of examples that we went through uh, to talk about the different areas that there has been progress and there has been developments in. So um, I'm not going to identify those again, but at the end there, the voices and involvement of Indigenous peoples will further enhance Indigenous health, well-being, and social economic standing as viable participants and partners within Canada. So again, the importance of institutions and businesses. So in order to grow as successful and economic, um, successful and economic contributors, Indigenous people need to be supported by the business communities. So again, supporting Indigenous businesses, 77% agree um, that Canadian corporations should include Indigenous owned and operated businesses in supply networks. Um, 72 believe, uh, sorry, 72% believe Indigenous businesses are needed to support sustainable economic opportunities for Indigenous people um, that they should be um, recommending to be providing training and mentoring as a long-term strategy while working with Indigenous business partners, um, hiring and promoting skilled and experienced and educated Indigenous employees, providing Indigenous cultural training, um, and hiring Indigenous people in building capacity when completing Indigenous specific work and initiatives. So as there is economic development and business growth occurring with the communities, non-Indigenous partners, it is important that there be that reciprocal and collaborative approach to working with them. So because of uh, poor health, well, wellness and social economic issues, so as we talk about um, the issues, it does present us within a deficit-based lens. Indigenous people, if you are to ask them, see them, like if you ask individuals, they see themselves from a strength-based perspective. So despite issues, we have a lot to be proud of as well, um, with pride in our culture and traditions, our communities, our families, <laughs> languages, self-determination, resiliency. So there's so many things that um, are strengths um, that we also bring to the table that we can contribute um, to create holistic health for everybody. Canadians in general must begin to change perspective and concepts about Indigenous people and how you can do it through interaction, learning and working with indig Indigenous people. So just being here tonight, I thank you um, because this is uh, encouraging to be able to say that individuals are interested in hearing about Indigenous people. A good start is beginning with a focus on the strengths of Indigenous people and their communities. So um, one of the things that is also uh, been um, occurring is the growth in uh, Indigenous businesses in Canada um, over the last number of years. In 2020, the gross domestic product created by Indigenous businesses were $48.9 billion. Um, an example of a business where there is um, an Indigenous built business that is now uh, owner of a off-community um, business is Mishapakot and First Nation. And I do not know how to say the other name of the First Nations, my apologies, but from Treaty 3. And along with the Morris Group Canada, um, they recently purchased the Victoria Inn Hotel and Convention Centre in Thunder Bay. So I, I just brought, I'm trying to bring in some examples of areas where Indigenous people um, are, um, businesses are growing successfully and at a phenomenal rate. So we finally get now to the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission report and the calls for action. So the reports, there were a number of reports. The um, report specific to the calls uh, for action is the one that we're going to focus on here. Um, I do encourage you to read the other reports. Uh, they are um, a compilation of information that was provided by providers of the residential schools uh, experiences. 
Um, there is the consultations that took place, um, what individuals wanted to express, what recommendations were made. Um, data was included in the reports. Um, so I, I, I think it's more an above and beyond and you may get a better and stronger picture of just what the impact of the residential school was as a result of the um, reports that were, um, were developed. So with that in mind, the background of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, just really quickly, extensive research and reports have been documented, um, documented the status and conditions of Indigenous people. So again, um, as I had indicated or encouraged, um, there is, um, if you check out the National uh, Center for Truth and Reconciliation, if you just Google that, um, or if you go online to look it up, uh, you will find that um, that very quickly. And those are reports that you can download and you can review it at le your leisure. So what makes the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report so unique? It was the first time reports were created to examine the legacy of the residential school system with calls for action to address the legacy. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was struck as part of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement signed by the federal government in 2007 with former Indigenous residential school students. So the reports themselves came out in two, um, 2015. So the purpose of the Truth and Reconciliation process was to create systems to ensure the abuses and impact of the residential school experience could never occur again acknowledge that horrific things occurred within the residential schools, improve the status and conditions of Indigenous people, and to facilitate reconciliation among former students, their families, their communities, and all Canadians. So truth be told that the success of the calls to action and the Truth and Reconciliation Report cannot be a success unless there is true engagement, not only from Indigenous people, but from Canadians. And that just occurred to me as I was, I was um, reading that. So the background of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report was guided by very specific principles that you can read about um, on their site. So the members of the commission, what they did as part of their process was they engaged with former students and their families and Canadians between 2007 and 2015. They listened, received feedback, enabled former students to share their stories and educated the public about residential schools and their legacy. Created a comprehensive record of the residential school garnering documents from multiple sources. And those records are now housed within the University of Manitoba. So they developed 94 calls to action to create reconciliation between Indigenous people and other Canadians through addressing the legacy of the residential schools. So this is a very busy um, graph. I didn't know how to do this otherwise, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I do think it is important to know what were the groups uh, groupings of the um, of the 94 calls to action. So the um, I also uh, put a link there um, to be able to say where you could to, uh, could look at those uh, in more detail. So the first uh, were about child welfare and youth. Um, it if you look through those and they go to 94. Um, that included child welfare, education, education and reconciliation, and youth programs. Uh, the second is language and culture, um, call to action for health, which was um, when I was working and this was the area that we really focused on because I was in primary health care. The justice in the legal system. So um, again, um, talking about justice, Canadian governments and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indi Indigenous People, which is also referred to as UNDRIP, uh, equity for Aboriginal people in the legal system, settlement agreement parties and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. 
Um, the fourth is history and commemoration. So um, calls for action under museums and archives, missing children and burial information and commemoration. Reconciliation um, is uh, listed as the Royal Proclamation and Covenant of Reconciliation, the National Council for Reconciliation, uh, professional development and training for public servants, church apologies and reconciliation, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, media and reconciliation, sports and reconciliation, business, businesses, I would think, and reconciliation and newcomers to newcomers to Canada. So if you, what I feel is one of the most encouraging things about the Truth and Reconciliation Report was a very strong focus, not only on addressing the issues experienced by Indigenous people, but the fact that there needs to be reconciliation and to create processes and things that will help that occur. And to me that that is probably um, in keeping with our values and our cultural ways that reconciliation is something so critical to the success of this whole thing that um, it, is, it is given, you know, very high um, as um, it's very high as a priority. Um, also, obviously being called truth and reconciliation. But um, I can't help but emphasize the importance of reconciliation being part of the success of Indigenous um, progress in some of the things that are currently uh, still being faced. So then I thought, okay, I've got to find, you know, what were some of the, since 2015, what progress has been made in responding to those TRC calls to action. And so I went to one site that had some, a good visual, and I thought that it was important to identify that. I then kept looking and doing research on this and found that it would be, it's difficult to be able to put that all together. Uh, the CBC also has another site where they are updating it all the time. And I will talk about that uh, in just a minute. So under the calls of action, um, they were developed and generally accepted as a process by which to heal and improve holistic outcomes for Indigenous people and their relationships with Canadians. So the visual was created by the Yellowhead Institute in 2022, so it's pretty current. It provides an overall sense of what has been done to accomplish the TRC calls for action. And given the rate to date, so if you are able to look at that, you will see that the in total of the 94, 13 calls to action have been completed. And what they uh, projected is that if this is the rate of the, the calls being uh, taken forward, it will take 42 years or until the year 2065 to complete all the calls to action. And so it um, puts it in perspective that, you know, there is, um, we don't necessarily have time in some situations. Um, the former students um, are getting older and there is generations um, that will have lived and passed on, you know, before those are done. So it, it really does put it in perspective for me. So the completed um, calls to action, just to, in case um, you, that was a question you might have had. Um, so there's general acknowledgement that the following have been initiated. So it gave some number of what they are. Um, federal acknowledgement of Indigenous language rights, missing and murdered Indigenous uh, women and girls inquiry. So it's in progress, in process adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People by Churches and Faiths, um, rejection of the Doctrine of Discovery by Churches and Faiths, and federal support for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, Reconciliation Agenda for the Canadian Council for the Arts, and also for the Indigenous Peoples T uh, Television Network, 
long-term support for all levels of government for the North American Indigenous Games and federal support for Indigenous sports programs and athletics, athletes, sorry. So progress in the government in addressing other um, TRC calls to action. So what I then did was I know that there's been progress in a number of those. So if you go to the government site um, about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, you will find under each of those, it will talk about what has occurred to date. So there is a report that is also being given by the government. So in uh, this is an example of one impending process. So uh, the call to action 53 to 56, and this was on the National Council for um, National Council for Reconciliation Act, and it was a call to establish um, this council. Um, did I say it right? The council and provide multi-year funding, uh, receive data from multi levels of government as requested. And then there be an annual reporting by the Prime Minister of Canada on the status of Abor Aboriginal people. So allowing, enabling the public to get a sense that there's been progress made in meeting the calls to action. So it's not in, it's not, um, it's not gone through formal assent, um, but there has been an Indigenous led transitional committee. Um, to help support the establishment of the council. And once passed, the National Council for Reconciliation will become a non-for-profit organization and the board of directors will be formed. So this is just one in progress that I gave you as an example. So some of the others would be um, number three, there's a new agreement between Ottawa and the Assembly of First Nations to compensate um, Indigenous people harmed by the child welfare system. And so again, it is not, it's not, um, it's not complete. It is in progress. And I, I took this down um, from the Assembly of First Nation. Um, and basically what it said was they're seeking approval of the revised final settlement agreement and that the settlement approval date at federal court um, has been set for October 23rd, uh, 2023. So again, it is, um, it is for Indigenous people harmed by the child welfare system. And so um, it is, it isn't in play yet, but it looks like it will go through and that it will be formally approved. Um, it has been certainly been a long pro, um, process. Another call to action number seven was to eliminate education and employment gaps and the government increased funding to support Indigenous students at the elementary, secondary and post-secondary level. And so again, it was, um, so these are things that are identified as being in process to addressing the calls to action. So I'm, I was trying to give you some examples. So I again talked about this interactive site that was created by CBC News and it's called 94, sorry, Beyond 94. And it's an interactive website. So again, I think if you go to that, it again puts it very clearly um, based on information that they have been researching and that they have gone to number feedback from the government, faith groups, professional and community uh, organizations. Um, they reviewed government and funding announcements, and they grouped them according to, if you look at the graph on the side, it's uh, by not started, in progress, in progress, underway, and then complete. And so it, it shows you um, clearly um, which of those things under child welfare, education, language, culture, health, justice, and reconciliation, just, you know, where they are in completing those. And I thought that that um, was a really good reference. And uh, I also cited where you can get that um, in the uh, slide here. So another example. So what are things that individual companies are doing uh, in order to um, support and show their support for the truth and reconciliation um, calls to action? So one of the things that, um, and these are I tried to grab small as well as big. And um, 
the Royal Canadian Mint um, have a have a um, a coin that's called the Truth and Reconciliation Keepsake, and it's to honor victims and survivors. And the proceeds from this uh, go toward public education and commemoration projects. So it's to be able, uh, I, I put the site on there as well. Canadian organization efforts towards truth and reconciliation. So in the area of education, as another example, uh, the University of Regina recently launched, and when I say recently, I think it was in the last few days, recently launched a multi-year plan quote, to position the university as a leader in Indigenous engagement and education, foster and mend relationships with Indigenous communities, acknowledge truths, and advance teaching and learning excellence. The plan will require systematic change and the commitment of the entire university com uh, community. And so when I talk about um, the importance of reconciliation, um, that's it right there. It requires change and a commitment of the entire community. Um, so some of the um, four action themes that they have identified is student success, spaces and places, teaching and learning, and community building. So another um, comment that was made by the project manager of the Indigenous Peoples Health Research Center, that is part of the University of Regina, he has uh, noted in his time significant changes at the university including how it is addressing Indigenous issues, Indigenous policies, and Indigenous research. So again, these are organizations who are working with Indigenous people to create um, and make changes that are part of what is being asked for in the calls um, call for action. So efforts. Um, one second. So there are other efforts that are being made. Um, currently, the government and public and private sectors and Canadians in general are seeking opportunities to understand how non-Indigenous interference adversely affected Indigenous people long term. So um, I know that that's something that comes up often in discussions that I have with my peers and colleagues. As importantly, participating in such learning opportunities can lead to a commitment to support and reconcile with Indigenous people. A positive and hopeful outcome of participation in learning and dialogue will lead to positive, building positive work in interpersonal relationships and supporting Indigenous efforts towards a better and holistic world for themselves. So many different organizations provide training opportunities for their employees, for the public, um, for their clients. And some also contribute funding to support Indigenous culture and traditions. Um, as one of those examples, the Niagara Falls Museum is an, exa is an excellent example of an org organization providing opportunities to learn about Indigenous people. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to bring this to you. So engaging with uh, in businesses and groups, an, an example would be, in addition to the ex exponential growth of Indigenous-owned businesses, many non-Indigenous businesses and companies are seeking opportunities to uh, pursue partnerships with, ind with Indigenous companies. So those decisions aren't just um, ideally, are, are not just a moral um, obligation, but are sound business and financial decisions and the benefits are reciprocal to both those companies and to the Indigenous companies. So in recent times, Canadian companies who have built new mines, secured timber harvesting rights or negotiated pipelines, um, there's other things, the solar panels, um, often uh, what I'm talking about is primary industry at this point. Um, they have signed partnership agreements with First Nations in most provinces and territories. So municipalities are also engaging with First Nations to support local economic growth. An example is uh, Cabao, First, uh, First Nation, and I'm sorry, and the town of Temiskaming and the municipality of Kippewa have developed a tripart friendship so they are looking to share uh, to, on tourism and on economic development. 
So um, one of the things that um, has been asked of me, and to me, this is part of, uh, has come out of the truth and reconciliation, is the Indigenous land acknowledgements. Um, so given the fact that it is increasing, um, I've been now on a number of boards where it has been introduced. Um, certainly, it is uh, something that Niagara Falls Museum is doing. So what is it and why are, why is this being done? I thought that it would be important to um, give some reasons and rationale for it. So an Indigenous land acknowledgement is written, uh, is a written or verbal statement delivered at meetings, conferences, gatherings by businesses, private companies, public owned companies, educational institutions, government entities, and others as a commitment and support towards truth and reconciliation with Indigenous people. So first and foremost, many of them start it as a result of making a commitment to that. So other first um, important rationale for the acknowledgements is that uh, it is a recognition of the Indigenous people who lived on the land before the arrival of settlers who still have a relationship with the land today, um, the history and its recognition of the history and impacts of colonization. And it is a step towards reconciliation and healing between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And so um, as a First Nation person, um, I have for my whole career um, been in many meetings uh, in communities and in other places um, that are not Indigenous, um, like in terms of their communities. And if it is an Indigenous meeting, um, always at the very beginning of the meeting, um, in before a prayer or at, at that time, there is land acknowledgement. Um, is, it is a traditional custom uh, that has been followed and has been used um, for my whole life. So the fact that it is something that is occurring in other settings, um, it just feels comfortable and it feels somewhat a little awkward uh, for myself as an Indigenous person being the only one potentially in the room. But there's also um, a feeling of humbleness at the respect that's given by the giving of that land acknowledgement. So I'm hoping that that is um, helpful in terms of any questions you might have had about the land uh, acknowledgements. So National Day um, for Truth and Reconciliation is upon us. It's on, on September the 30th, and it's marking the third National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Individuals are invited to show their support and recognition of the legacy of residential school era by wearing an orange shirt, September 30th is a, um, oh my. I think Dr. Williamson is just having a momentary issue with her internet. If everyone could just sit tight for a moment, um, hopefully things will be resolved. I appreciate your understanding in terms of these technical difficulties. Um, Dr. Williamson, are you, are you there? Oh, okay. So it looks like Dr. Williamson, I think something happened with her internet. I'm hoping that she's gonna come back on. Um, so we'll just maybe give her a moment while we see if she can rejoin into the lecture. Um, in the meantime, I'll just quickly go over our housekeeping again. If she's able to rejoin, we will open up for questions uh, following the end of her presentation. So if you do have any questions, you're welcome to put them into the Q&A section if you're joining us on Zoom. Um, and if you happen to be joining us on Facebook Live, you can just write your comments right into, sorry, your questions, sorry, right into the comment section and I'll be able to um, bring those questions forward at the very end. Hello, welcome back. <laughs> when did I get off? Uh, you just popped off um, 
just moments ago, like honestly, it's been maybe one and a half minutes, two minutes. So don't worry. <laughs> I just joined nice. on when, when I saw that you weren't coming back, but uh, if you're good to reach from Northern Ontario. So we <laughs> you're now you understand our cognitivity issues. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Not at all. These things happen. <laughs> So the, the only thing I was going to do was to strongly uh, encourage individuals. Um, I talked about the land acknowledgement. Did you hear that? Yes, we heard all of that piece. Okay, awesome. Um, so um, all I, I had was one more slide to be able to talk about the um, uh, different uh, events that are happening in the Niagara Falls region. But I think at this point, given the time, um, I can put the slide up again, but I really uh, think that um, you can just Google it because it's um, where I got it from was basically, um, I'm not even finding it now, um, is was basically from um, online and it said something about events in the Niagara Falls region. <laughs> so please uh, go and if th those are some of the things that are, are of interest to you. And that was, I believe, the last of my, oh, one more. Can I finish that one then? Yes, of course. So Go the reality it. in life experiences, the reality in life experiences of Indigenous people is are complex and differ greatly from other Canadians. So this is just a wrap up. A way towards holistic health and wellness and socioeconomic standing is moving forward slowly. It's Hap it's happening, it's slow, but it's surely happening. Partnerships and economic opportunities support Indigenous growth, and more importantly, recognize and promote the strengths of minority cultures previously marginalized. Regaining cultural identity is a critical element. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission report challenged Canadians uh, and Canada to know the truth about what happened to Indigenous people and to reconcile and support positive change for, with them. So not for them, with them. The understanding and support from Canadians is key to the healing and success of in, uh, Indigenous people. I put a number of quotes in there and that's where I wanted to leave it. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, very informative. I really enjoyed that. And I, I won't say lecture, the dreaded word, <laughs> but conversation perhaps we'll say. Um, so to everybody who is joining us, now is the opportunity for your questions. Again, if you're on Zoom, you can type them into the Q&A function and I will ask them for you. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, again, write into the comment section and I will read them out. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody is going to ask a question, I do have one to get us started. Um, and my question is, what are your hopes for what the TRC calls for action can do to improve the relationship and standing between Indigenous people and other Canadians? So it is a very, um, it is a very important question, I think. Um, it's difficult to answer because as an Indigenous person, um, I've been fortunate. I'm, I know that um, I'm grateful for my life. I am aware of, um, you know, the struggles um, and certainly um, am frustrated by the slowness by which some things are, you know, uh, improving. Um, it seems sometimes when we take a couple steps forward, you know, there are other areas where, you know, um, other critical things come up. Um, and one of the things that is on my heart right now is uh, the amount of um, drug use, um, including, you know, the drugs like uh, fentanyl and what it is doing to um, our communities and our community members. So I am hopeful that, and I do know the power of culture. I do know the power of working together. And one of the things that I think that I love most about the Truth and Reconciliation reports was that they not only said what happened, and it's pretty raw, like when you, if you get a chance to read them, 
um, and, but it also says how resilient, you know, as indi Indigenous people we are. And so I have strong hope. I am proud of my First Nation. I am proud of um, the individuals that I've had the opportunity to work with. And there is, a, you know, with that going forward, and when I say that progress is being made slowly but surely, I, I think that with what the commitments have been made through the Truth and Reconciliation by the government, by businesses, by Canadians um, to support this, I think it'll go faster. Um, that is my hope for the future. And regardless of that, uh, I think that on our own strengths, you know, we can we can conquer, we can overcome these things. Um, but I think it helps the more people um, that are supportive uh, in helping the process for sure. Thanks. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us over the course of this entire year. This is our, our third conversation with you um, in 2023. And um, I know from everyone in the museum community that's joining us tonight and who's joined us throughout the year, we just wanna say thank you so much for coming and um, embarking on this journey with us from you know, exploring the realities of life of First Nation peoples living in Canada, to the importance of self-determination um, and those culturally relevant approaches that you discussed in a previous um, discussion and then tonight with the TRC and really exploring the report and where, we, where we're headed and what has been completed and what we're working towards as a nation. Um, and I see we do not have any questions, but I think that's just a testament to your presentations and um, your ability to concisely share all of your knowledge and all this information with us. So thank you so much for being on this journey with us throughout this year. Um, and I want to say thank you to everyone who joined us tonight from our museum community from Niagara Falls and beyond wherever you might be joining us from. That's the beauty of having these virtual conversations is we can have presenters like yourself who are not local to come and chat with us and then anyone across the nation is welcome to join us. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart and from the rest of the museum community. And I do see one of our um, one of our attendees tonight has said, thank you, excellent and informative. So perfectly worded. <laughs> Before we say goodnight tonight, um, I also just wanna share with the community who has joined us tonight that we do have another free session on Zoom tomorrow. Rick Hill will be joining us for a conversation at 3 p.m is Indigenous nationhood still possible? So keeping in mind with our Truth and Reconciliation Day on Saturday, we have that lecture coming up as well. You can go to um, nfexchange.ca to sign up for the Zoom um, chat that's happening tomorrow, again at 3 p.m. So thank you, Dr. Pamela, for joining us for this year. And I hope you have a wonderful evening and to everybody else who joined us tonight. Thank you. Night, everyone.